I'm excited now to introduce our, our keynote speaker to close us out, Dr. Ned Sharpless, Director of the National Cancer Institute. Dr. Sharpless has been the NCI Director since October of 2017, and he's overseen the implementation of the Cancer Moonshot, as well as NCI's response to COVID-19. Early in the pandemic, Dr. Sharpless warned about the devastating effects of the pandemic on cancer care and research. And he urged action to address the interruptions in care and research. And he led by constructive example, providing supplemental funding to support researchers who were losing private sector funding. We're grateful to Dr. Sharpless for taking time out of his busy schedule to be here today and to talk about a range of topics and updates on NCI activities. Thank you so much, Dr. Sharpless. Uh, great. Thank you for the uh, welcome, uh, welcoming remarks and uh, for having me today. I'm really uh, glad to have the opportunity to visit again. Uh, I'll, do, I'll be virtually. I think we've done this in person in the past, but uh, I guess sign of the times. Um, I, I'd like, uh, you know, it's a real pleasure to speak to you again. The uh, National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship has been doing really terrific work for so long, and I, I think it's a, a true partner uh, for the National Cancer Institute in this common struggle that we really want to sort of lessen the impact of the devastating effects of cancer on our patients. In particular, I think the NCCS has really shown up for the cancer community during the pandemic with important resources for people with cancer and healthcare providers to help them navigate what's been a really challenging uh, situation because of the need to provide care to do, to do what we need to do for cancer outcomes, but also to do it in a way that's safe for caregivers and for patients. And so like all of you, the NCI for more than a year now has been in wrestling with the effects of this global pandemic and its impact on cancer and cancer research and our own work at, at, at home and, 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 and in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, I will say that I think uh, despite the disruption the pandemic has provided, um, it's been a pretty strong year for cancer research. I think the uh, work of the NCI uh, you know, still has been able to go proceed apace during uh, the pandemic. Uh, we've been able to disperse grants and to fund research and scientists have been able to eventually get into labs. And so I think in, in, in terms of years of productivity for cancer research, 2020 and 2021 are, are, are good, even despite the problems of the pandemic. But I will touch on the many ways it's affected clinical research and basic and translational research. And now that we sort of started to turn the corner, um, I, I think uh, it's time to really talk about what comes next. How do we recover from this episode? to get back to this very positive trajectory of, of cancer uh, progress that we were on before. Maybe next slide, please. So today I thought I'd talk a bit about the uh, 50th anniversary of the National Cancer Act. I think an important landmark in our field that um, is an area where the National Cancer Institute would like help from stakeholders about communicating the significance of this anniversary to the general community and, and, and specifically to Congress. I'll mention the cancer moonshot. I'll talk a bit about appropriations and pay lines. Uh, I'll talk about the impact of COVID-19, and I'll mention a few uh, items related to the NCI's efforts in cancer survivorship. And lastly, I'll finish on uh, our equity and inclusion initiative. Uh, so next slide, please. I think one of the things that uh, is probably known to this group already, but is really exciting in the cancer community right now is, is the real commitment of the present administration to cancer research. Uh, you know, this is a, a, a group that has a very strong personal connection to cancer. I think the the president and first lady's connection to cancer uh, through their son, Bo, uh, is well known. Um, and uh, I'm sure many of you remember that then Vice President Biden uh, during the Obama administration was one of the principal architects, if not the principal architect of the uh, cancer moonshot. Uh, additionally, the, uh, the vice president has a connection to cancer. Her, her, her mom was actually a cancer researcher and uh, she's spoken about uh, that experience growing up working in her mom's lab and her connections to cancer research and, and, and friends of hers that have been affected by cancer. Uh, and the, the, the first lady in particular has really uh, taken this uh, uh, topic uh, to heart as well. She, one of her first acts as a uh, first lady was to visit us virtually at the National Cancer Institute as shown up here on the top left. And then we, she followed that up with a actual real in-person visit uh, to the Massey Cancer Center in Richmond, Virginia, on which I accompanied her and we went and heard about the great work in cancer health disparities and other topics being done at, at Massey. Uh, and I, I think probably all of you now have heard uh, President Biden's remark of uh, what he wants to accomplish in cancer, and that is this, this idea of ending cancer as we know it. And uh, you know, we in, in the administration are now trying to, to figure out how to make that happen, you know, really, really actualize that, that strong desire. Uh, and, and this is what drives us at the NCI, and this is what provides the passion and sense of mission that I think is familiar to all of you as well. Uh, next slide, please. 
So, you know, I think an important thing to kind of decide when you talk about what it would mean to end cancer as we know it is, 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 is to sort of set some parameters. I think basically, uh, you know, given what we know about the biology of cancer and aging and the, their, their fundamental relationship, I don't think it's reasonable to expect a world without cancer completely anytime soon. That would require, I think, uh, scientific advances that are not close. But uh, what, and I think the, the president gets this. That's why he didn't say, I want to eradicate all cancer deaths or cure all cancer or something like that. I, I think when you really talk about how you know cancer, what we know about cancer, we're really talking about the familiarity of the, the sort of the tragedy and the consummate unfairness of cancer. And that's this the cancer that affects children and young, otherwise healthy people, and that kills men and women in the primes of their lives, and that brings about intractable symptoms and intractable pain and, 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 and things that we're not really able to address adequately. And, and so while I don't think it's likely that we'll end all cancer death, I think eradicating a significant majority of cancer, uh, particularly in, in patients without other comorbidity uh, who are able to tolerate therapy for cancer, I think that is doable. And I think that's a worthy goal. And I, I propose sort of an interim step, I, I, you know, so that we're, we're not solely relying on gauzy, ill-defined metrics here, but we have a, a real solid uh, piece of progress would be uh, uh, the goal of cutting uh, cancer mortality in the United States in half from its peak in the early 1990s. So cancer mortality in the United States has been declining since about 1991. And that rate of decline has uh, recently sh sharpened, it, it has accelerated in the last two years, the, the most two, two most recent years for which we have data. And uh, to really uh, cut cancer mortality from half at its peak would require accelerating that decline even more. So, you know, if the pace of what we're sort of going at right now, which is on the order of 2.5% per year decline, which is, is, is the faster pace, that's the accelerated pace of the last few years, uh, to, to get to that halfway point would take till 2031. Uh, but I think, by, I believe that with continued acceleration, which I, I think we can expect to happen for a variety of reasons, uh, using all the tools available to us in cancer research, including prevention and screening and therapy, I think we may be able to get there as soon as 2026, which would be five years from now, which I think would be a remarkable statement to take uh, you know, this, this peak mortality and reduce that in half in, in that period of time would be a clear sign of progress in cancer research and would be the kind of thing we need to do on our way to ending cancer as we know it. It's a very tall order, it's an ambitious goal, but I do think it is a realistic one. Uh, next slide, please. And I think this is uh, happening at a good time uh, to have this emphasis on cancer research uh, because you know the National Cancer Institute with our stakeholders such as the NCCS, we've been talking about uh, the 50th cancer, uh, the 50th anniversary of the National Cancer Act. And this is a, a commemoration of this important milestone. And I think there's widespread enthusiasm to talk about this. I, I believe the cancer research community considers this anniversary an opportunity to ignite and, and inspire the next generation of cancer researchers and cancer cancer and supporters of cancer research. Uh, and so that, that is uh, really what the NCI sees as sort of a convening role here of, of uh, you know, creating a common set of materials and a sort of common set of way of talking about this anniversary that uh, can be widely used across the community. And you, you see images of some of the uh, communication and branding that we've done at the NCI. And you'll notice none of this is really specific to the NCI. We envision any group that's interested in talking about the NCA could use these kinds of uh, uh, inform information and, and communication materials to talk about the areas of cancer progress that, that interest them. I think it's important that we're commemorating this anniversary because a lot of important stuff has happened in the last 50 years. But I, I don't think celebrate is quite the right word because we still have you know, 600,000 Americans dying per year of cancer in the United States. We still have a lot of suffering from cancer, even in patients that are cured in terms of uh, you know, adverse outcomes and, and survivorship challenges. And so I, I think really it's important to acknowledge what we've done, but also talk about where the opportunities uh, still remain. Uh, I also, in the bottom right here, is shown a nice video on the National Cancer Act available on our website. And I commend it to those of you who haven't seen it yet. I think it's really a powerful and talks about the NCA in a way that is uh, you know, very patient focused and is useful. Uh, next slide, please. I'd like to briefly discuss the cancer moonshot. I think we're in a, so a little more than midway past the uh, midway point of the or a little more, the, a little bit past the midway point of the moonshot. And I think the progress to date has been quite impressive. As you will recall, Congress uh, began the moonshot in fiscal year 2017, and the idea was to have seven years of funding. Uh, so it would lapse in 2023. Uh, we are just beginning year five of that funding, and the idea was to spend on the order of $1.8 billion over that period on a number of areas that were identified through this formal process that included a blue ribbon panel uh, coming up with these highly translational opportunities to really accelerate research 
and progress for cancer patients uh, in a variety of topics across the cancer continuum. And this includes things like, you know, fundamental drivers of cancer and childhood cancers, and then research to, you know, increase genetic counseling and screening for individuals with inherited predispositions to cancer, uh, new approaches to clinical trials to get more information out of our clinical trials related to cancer respo responses of cancer patients, a whole new immuno-oncology networks for children and adults to try and further the use of immuno-oncology as a modality for therapeutic uh, ends in, in patients. And then and new efforts to really engage patients dif differently and, and, and communicate with patients differently and get them on clinical trials differently and provide them the opportunity to participate in research directly. Uh, but many more topics. In fact, there are sort of 240 uh, new initiatives really in the Moonshot. They are heavily, heavily detailed on our website, cancer.gov. And uh, you know, there's uh, quite a bit of information there. And now I think you know, sort of five years in, we're starting to begin to see the you know, we're moving past just starting new clinical trials and setting up new networks to start to see some actual results of these, this work that I think will be highly impactful for patients. So it's an exciting time for the Cancer Moonshot. Also, of course, the NCI is very busy in planning on what comes next, how to accommodate you know, this infrastructure that uh, we've built and created and is very valuable. But you know, what will happen is uh, funding for the Moonshot Sunsets in 2023 and how we'll preserve the good elements of the Moonshot to, you know, use for further progress. And so this is an ongoing discussion at the NCI. As you can imagine, this has been further energized by the uh, new uh, commitment of the new administration uh, to uh, cancer research and, and the, in the uh, requests in the president's budget for additional funding for cancer research. So uh, that will uh, clearly have implications for how we uh, transition moonshot activities. Uh, next slide, please. I wanted to call out a few uh, specific activities in the moonshot uh, related to survivorship, since I know that's of interest to this group. Um, we've had a blog post on the Moonshot uh, at our website that is worth looking at, and there will also be an upcoming publication in Cancer Cell written by Dina Singer and myself on the topic that sort of describes the progress to date. But I think, um, you know, uh, the Moonshot, the, the sort of survivorship focus is partially outlined here. Uh, and also, uh, we have set up a, a group of a, a, a monthly seminar series on Moonshot initiatives that I think um, has uh, been a good way of communicating uh, progress in Moonshot. And those are all available on our website. And uh, there was one such today by Carl June, in fact, talking about CAR-T programs supported by the Moonshot. So uh, to maintain this progress and pace of progress made possible on the Moonshot, we need to really ensure continuation of these, these great programs, some of which you see here. And uh, as I mentioned, that, that is uh, requiring significant planning at the present moment. Uh, next slide, please. I'd like to take a moment to talk about the uh, budgetary situation of the National Cancer Institute. There is a uh, strong bipartisan support for cancer research and we've received increases to our base appropriation in a very steady way since uh, you know, at least 2013. Uh, and as you can see, moonshot funds are uh, then added over and above our base appropriation. And that is shown in this sort of orange bar here on the graph uh, starting in, uh, in, in, in 2017. And then you can also see in 2020, for the first year, we had this uh, green bar, uh, which is the Childhood Cancer Data Initiative, which we've just begun uh, year two of that, and I think is off to a great start. Also in 2020, Congress appropriated an additional uh, $306 million to the NCI for coronavirus research, for COVID serolo serologic research. And that was a one-time uh, supplemental funding uh, that we've uh, used for a variety of COVID activities, some of which I'll, I'll talk about uh, in a bit. Uh, we are just getting started with the process for FY 2022. Um, as I think I mentioned, the president's budget has recently been released and includes increases in funding for the NIH, as well as um, uh, support for a new entity uh, called ARPH uh, that would uh, take on cancer search among other uh, diseases. Uh, next slide, please. As you're aware, these uh, sort of modest increases to our budget year to year have occurred uh, at the same time with a fairly massive increase in grant applications to the National Cancer Institute. And I, I think this is uh, in many ways a good sign. There's uh, a lot of enthusiasm for cancer research and there's tremendous influx of new ideas. Uh, and this translates into people coming to the National Cancer Institute support, seeking support for their work. Uh, and this enthusiasm in many ways great, but it does have the untoward effect of driving our success rates, our pay lines down, uh, because you know if we have an increase in applications and, and don't increase the amount of grants we're funding, then pay lines will go down. And at some point, uh, that becomes very uh, unsustainable. We, we worry that uh, 
low pay lines will turn off investigators and will drive people out of cancer research to other fields. And we also believe very passionately that the some of the really most important ideas and the things that really move the needle in cancer research come out of investigator initiated research. So we believe that uh, scientists with good ideas should be able to submit that idea directly to the NCI uh, in an investigator initiated way and get funded through a traditional mechanism. So uh, starting a few years ago, we made uh, success rates and grant pay lines a real priority and have made a, a, a massive new investment into the RPG pool, the pool of monies that supports these grants. And we have to do this very gradually because all these grants have out your costs. And so a modest increase in 2020, you know, we, we have to then live with for the next five years in many instances. So, so we've been gradually trying to get pay lines up and at their nadir, at their lowest point, they were down to 8% for an established investigator R R01, which is the sort of workhorse grant of basic scientists and, and translational researchers. And now uh, this year we, we have uh, gotten up to the 11th percentile. So a 35% increase which is good progress, but I would argue 11% is still quite low and it should be higher still, which is why this, this goal shown on the right is one we've been very explicit about. We'd like to try and get pay lines up to the 15th percentile by 2025. And that would also increase pay lines for new, new investigators and R21 and you know, other grants as mechanisms as well. And that I think that would be a very visible signal to the community, to our commitment to investigator initiated research. And, um, would I think uh, you know continue to make cancer research a uh, winning proposition for new scientists? Uh, of course, that if you look at the amount of funding that will require, uh, it's it's fairly significant. So uh, on the order of we've already put in on the order of six hundred million dollars a year into the RPG pool over the last few years, it would be an increase of about that size to go forward. Uh, that's a lot of money. So to do that, we really would need the uh, help of Congress. We would need additional support from Congress to get to the fifteen by twenty five goal that we've been talking about. Uh, next slide. I thought I'd uh, mention a few of our coronavirus research activities. As, as, as I stated, the uh, Congress provided specific funding for this topic. Uh, a, a subset of the activities are listed here. It's really a, a lot of stuff that we've been doing on coronavirus, and I really don't uh, won't go through all of these today. But I think um, it gives a flavor that we've had. Uh, the, the, the funding is for ser serological sciences and related technologies, and. That, that's the antibody response to a coronavirus, which is important in making immunity. It's important in measuring vaccine efficacy, and it's important in measuring prior infections. So it's a critical research topic, and it's an area where the NCI has expertise because of our longstanding work on other viruses like HPV and hepatitis B, which cause cancer. So it was relatively straightforward for the NCI to pivot some of our activities to uh, work on coronavirus research during the, 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 the depths of the pandemic. And we created a really important network called the Serological Sciences Network, CIRANET, of you know, over 25 academic institutions getting funding to work on clinical and basic science questions related to the serologic response. And you know, many of that science that's not coming out of CIRANET are things that you know, you're reading about in the New York Times and other, uh, in other areas in the media. We conducted a, a translational serological um, uh, set of studies, and these are things like a serum protection studies to see if uh, antibody levels correlate with risk of infection, or serum prevalence studies to tell if uh, you know, how many people in an area have had prior infection. And we've worked with the FDA closely to evaluate a test performance, and that's been a lively set of interactions. We have a number of things going on with the CDC and NIST and DARPA and BARDA and other partners. Uh, and then on the right, you see uh, things that we tried to do to support cancer researchers during the pandemic. So this includes. Uh, flexibility for our grantees and changing how we do clinical trials and modeling to predict long-term out out cancer outcomes. And then we've done a number of other, uh, you know, very interesting topics that uh, for, for in, in, in the interest of time, I will not cover. So I just say it's a, a, a very uh, good portfolio and I think has been a critical to the NIH response and the HHS response to the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. One of the things we've done is this national trial called the NCAPS trial, which the idea is to uh, study the uh, natural history of coronavirus infection in patients with cancer. This is now open at more than 900 sites. So this is at community oncology sites throughout the country, and we've enrolled more than 1,000 patients. And uh, really, the, the, this has a longitudinal collection of samples and, 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 and data collection on the patients. And so it really will understand the natural history of coronavirus infection in patients with uh, various types of cancer, and particularly patients who may have weakened immune systems but also will be a good study to get this topic of long COVID or, or the post-acute sequelae of COVID infection, the, the long-term sequelae of COVID infection. And I think this will be a good study to really address the uh, frequency of that event in patients with cancer and also the, 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 the complications of long-term long COVID infection. 
Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we've talked a lot about the effect of the pandemic on cancer care and cancer research. Uh, this is a multi-part story. Uh, you know, we, as, as I mentioned at the uh, beginning, the NCI became very worried on this topic, uh, you know, last spring when we learned that many institutions had closed their cancer screening facilities and were deferring so-called elective surgeries, you know, mastectomies and colectomies for cancer that were, in our opinion, very important uh, treatment surgeries. But uh, we're not being able to be done because of limited capacity uh, and need to preserve ICU beds and preserve hospital staff. And uh, so we um, uh, did some modeling at the NCI and, and realized that uh, these disruptions in cancer screening and diagnosis and care could translate into excess mortality and began talking about that loudly and uh, gather, gathering data from other sources and working with other partners, such as the American College of Surgeons and ASCO and ACR and the American Cancer Society and you know, any group that's really interested in the care of patients during this period. And, uh, you know, now it's become clear as we've seen data from many, many different sources that uh, cancer screenings, you know, colonoscopy and mammography and pap smears, things like that, are, were down markedly during the pandemic. Uh, cancer diagnoses were down markedly during the pandemic. Uh, clinical trials accrual were down markedly during the pandemic. Certain kinds of cancer care, like uh, elective surgery and chemotherapy and radiation treatment, were down uh, significantly during the pandemic. And all of this we believe will still begin, eventually translate into patients being diagnosed at later stages. So upstaging, and we're beginning to see evidence of that and then eventually excess mortality. And so we're, we, I think collectively as a community, we have to think about how to make the impact of the pandemic at least bad for our patients. Uh, and this is a, a graphic from Time Magazine sort of describing those various things I just mentioned of decreased screening, diagnosis, treatment and excess mortality. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, as I said, uh, much of this uh, analysis initially came from the NCI CISNET network, that, you know, which is a network of modeling, uh, uh, cancer modeling experts, and uh, who really took up this problem uh, very early, early on, and I think helped sound the alarm. Uh, next slide. So I mentioned a, a lot of data is now coming together to, 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 to paint this common story. I'll just share some of uh, these data, but, you know, this is like CMS data and data from electronic health records and other sources, but these are data I'll show from our PROSPER network. We have a PROSPER consortium, which is the population-based research to optimize the screening process. And it's an NCI-funded effort that's gone on for a while. It's very interesting in the topic of cancer screening. And they have been gathering data from many sites to look at you know, what's happened during the pandemic. And, and you can see, uh, at least through May here, that there was this fairly dramatic drop in April, in March, April, uh, May of 2020, in, uh, in this case, colon, colon cancer screening, and lung cancer screening. Uh, I, I, you know, we, we estimate that most screening was down during the height of the pandemic on the order of 95%. You'll see the one thing that was not so affected here on the left was this FIT screening, which is you know, maybe a kind of, it doesn't require necessarily going to a doctor. It might be a better, a better FIT, no pun intended, uh, for the pandemic. And so um, I think this is the kind of thing, the pandemic has provided some research opportunities. And, and so we, we have learned that uh, some kinds of screening or some kinds of care uh, maybe more amenable to uh, the telehealth era or the you know self collection at home self sampling screening kind of approaches and and that's uh, I think an interesting research opportunity for the NCI. Next slide. And so here's here's the same data for Pap smears and mammography also in the Prosper network and you can see as I said this uh, fairly significant disruption. We're following now to see how the recovery has occurred uh, in terms of cancer screening and. Um, we believe uh, for all these screening modalities, they have shown recovery uh, through 2020 and the beginning of 2021, but we also don't think it's complete. So we still believe there are populations that haven't returned for screening and are concerned about you know, how to get that uh, problem fixed. There's, there's fear of coming into the doctor still. There are populations that uh, you know, uh, are, are uh, still worried about coronavirus transmission during uh, routine care. And uh, we also believe there's a, maybe a cancer disparities element here. We, we believe, based on data from the CDC, that some populations are returning to screening uh, without reservation and others are uh, still quite skeptical. And so we believe that's an opportunity to truly, you know, we really don't want to have uh, the pandemic worsen cancer health inequity. And uh, so we have started to think about opportunities uh, for the NCI to provide research and, and, and advice on these, on these areas as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and uh, here's uh, sort of one of those research efforts. So um, 
uh, I like to say if you're a dissemination and implementation researcher, your, your moment has arrived because we had this amazing thing happen in the United States where telehealth was quite uh, unusual. It was rarely used for routine cancer care. And within about a two week period, because of changes uh, from the payers and, 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 and government uh, advice uh, from CMS particularly, uh, telehealth became very common for uh, routine cancer care throughout the country and, and, and in a very short period. And now we have uh, you know, a year of, of, of data of how this works. And so uh, we thought this was a excellent time to set up a, a sort of network to study uh, these questions using a P50 mechanism to create these centers of excellence for uh, studying uh, the impact of telehealth research on within this rapidly changing environment. And to really understand what works, you know, what, what kinds of treatments for cancer and or, uh, you know, care for cancer is very amenable to telehealth and, and what things don't work. Presumably, uh, many aspects of cancer still are, care are still going to have to be done in person. And, and what are the barriers to using telehealth? Is it, you know, consent for clinical trials? Is it care across state lines? Is it the ability to ship medicines uh, directly to the patients? You know, what are the things that are uh, limiting our progress in this area? And I think, uh, you know, the pandemic has driven this interest, but it is a real opportunity uh, to get uh, to improve care for all patients, even when the pandemic is gone. I will say we polled patients and providers on some of these things that we've done. You know, the uh, the ability to enroll in clinical trials, for example, by telehealth, and the ability to have medicine shipped directly to patients during the pandemic, and they're very popular. So patients like to be able to receive care across state lines. They like to be able to do a lot of these activities by phone, and I predict patients are not going to want to go back. That, that we've learned during this period that you can do a lot of these things safely. They work by telehealth. And, and, and I think it will really, as I said, provide enhanced care for patients when the pandemic is done. Uh, next slide. I think all of you are aware uh, that we're thrilled at the NCI to have hired uh, Emily Tonorezos uh, to join us as the director of the NCI's Office of Cancer Survivorship within the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences. Emily's a really a gifted leader and I, I, I know you will find her a great person with which to work. And under, under Emily's leadership already, you know, the Office of Cancer Survivorship has taken on an exciting portfolio of, of uh, topics. And this includes developing an agenda for the continuous acquisition of knowledge concerning the problems and challenges facing cancer survivors and their families. I think there's a real interest in improving the quality of survival of all, of all individuals diagnosed with cancer, including prevention of subsequent disease and disability. And then there's a, an interest in promoting the dissemination of information to professionals who treat cancer patients and, their, and the public uh, concerning the problems and needs of cancer survivors and their families. And so I, you know, it's, a, it's a great, uh, exciting agenda that Emily's off to, and I think she will be a good partner for this group to work with on the NCI's portfolio. Uh, next slide, please. I'll give a quick update on the NCI's implementation of the STAR Act, which stands for Survivorship Treatment Access and Research. NCI is currently supporting implementation of several Childhood Cancer STAR Act provisions that are directed towards the Institute. As encouraged in, in, in Section 202 of the STAR Act, in addition to continuing to conduct and support childhood, adolescent, and young adult cancer survivorship research, research NCI is also expanding support in this area for new projects, in particular to focus on cancer types and subtypes for which treatment, uh, current treatments are, are least, less effective. And so there's several uh, new biobanking projects going on related to STAR Act. So the Children's Oncology Group, a rare tumor populations biobank has been stood up. And this is a new project to support tumor tissue and blood collection with priority for tumor types with high risk of treatment failure. We're also collaborating with the Childhood uh, Cancer Survivor Study to study subsequent cancers and to conduct biologic and genetic evaluations to better understand the causes of chronic health conditions. And we have a strong specimen collection underway in the uh, collaboration with the Childhood Cancer Data Initiative, the CCDI, that I mentioned earlier. We're also working closely with the Agency for Health uh, Research and Quality, AHRQ, to identify best practices in survivorship care in uh, these populations. Just last month, AHRQ de delivered the first of three rigorous evidence reviews on disparities and, barrier disparities and barriers to pediatric cancer survivorship. And there was a webinar to discuss that report earlier this week. Uh, the next reports will focus on models of care and transitions in care for children and AYA cancer survivors. Uh, next slide. So very much in uh, the interest of the NCI and the NIH are, are very uh, focused on the problems of structural racism in biomedical research. So NIH Director uh, Francis Collins issued a strong and committed statement to that effect the last week, uh, which I then followed up with a statement of my own. 
uh, structural racism in biomedical research is real and we have to address this. And let me start with a review here of the NIH program that, is, uh, that, that Francis recently announced uh, to, uh, to take on uh, these problems where the NIH has special equities. And then I'll also mention a little bit about the NCI effort that is highly related and complementary to the NIH effort. So the NIH program is called UNITE and it's designed to address the need for diversity, equity, inclusion in our research community and to identify and dismantle any policies and practices that may harm our workforce and our science. Its specific objective is to end structural racism and racial inequities in biomedical research. Uh, next slide. And at the NC in NCI, we've developed the equity inclusion program and this, uh, these committees that and working groups of our program unite uh, merge with the UNITE program uh, working groups. Uh, we have an equity council that is sort of a steering committee that is, uh, can includes senior and, 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 and less senior leaders of the NCI that I chair, along with Paulette Gray. And we have these five working groups focused on cancer health disparities, our workforce, uh, creating a good culture of inclusion within NCI, NCI, and then a tracking and evaluation working group and a communications and outre outreach working group. And uh, we've already announced many uh, very specific activities that we are taking to address uh, problems of structural racism in biomedical research, uh, but we have more longer term activities in the offing. Uh, next slide, please. So I'd like to close there. And again, thank you for the opportunity to speak today and, and for your great partnership with the NCI. And I, I hope uh, we have some time for a lively discussion. I'm sure there's a lot to talk about. So maybe I'll uh, end there and, and, and see what's on your mind. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharpless. Um, you have covered an incredible amount of material in, in a short amount of time. Um, I have some questions, but I also invite the audience to, um, to submit their questions using the Q&A. First of all, I just want to thank you for your leadership, because clearly, um, not only were, are your leadership in terms of the moonshot and all of the, the work that NCI was doing before the pandemic, but the way you were able to be nimble and, and really think creatively about how do we address the, uh, the challenges that the pandemic brought us in terms of cancer care. So thank you on behalf of patients and survivors for that. Um, I also want to uh, say that you did a great job in choosing Dr. Tony Rizos for the um, Office of Cancer Survivorship. We've had the opportunity to work with her quite a bit, and she is really visionary and so patient-centered. Um, we've talked with her quite a bit about the needs of metastatic cancer patients in terms of survivorship care, and she's really she really listens and is so thoughtful about it. And I know that that her team is convening a meeting next month um, with uh, uh, to talk about the needs of metastatic and long-term cancer patients in terms of survivorship care. And I think she's just really creative in thinking about the needs of cancer patients and not being kind of hemmed in by definitions and really looking at uh, holistically at the needs. I know she had really big shoes to fill with Dr. Roland, who is now one of our board members and Dr. Mayer, who um, served as an interim director of the office, but I think uh, she's incredible and we're really great. Uh, we're grateful to, for the opportunity to work with her. And she's very, just so open to hearing from patient advocates about what our, our constituents need. So we're grateful for that. So um, my first question to you is, could you talk a little bit more about the proposal for ARPA-H and what does it mean? How will it work? How will, what will be the relationship with um, the NCI if this gets off the ground as the president has proposed in his budget? Yeah, uh, yes, it's an interesting topic. <laughs> you can imagine it's been very energizing the community. Let me, let me before I answer that, I, I wanna make one remark, which is, um, you know, you talked about uh, leadership during the pandemic. I, I, I actually have trouble explaining this to individuals. It, it has certainly not been fun to lead the NCI during a pandemic. This has been a global public health tragedy, and obviously, uh, you know, the the um, the emergency is uh, uh, in many ways overwhelming. But uh, it's been incredibly, I guess, the right word is gratifying. I mean, the um, the uh, support from Congress and the you know, national can-do spirit to try and uh, take on this challenge as quickly as possible across government. We're, you know, working with the FDA and the CDC and other parts of the NIH and NIST and BARDA and DARPA, you know, whatever. It's been uh, really uh, great. And the work has been phenomenally interesting. I mean, I think that um, we have learned a lot. And I think the, uh, as I said, the pandemic scientific response has been very strong, uh, you know, in many areas, not, not the least of which has been the successful creation of a vaccine within a year. But, um, but it's been a real privilege to be at the NCI during this period because, uh, you know, as I said, the, the work has been immensely gratifying. Uh, and I, I agree. I think Emily's a great hire, and I'm glad she's off on the right foot with uh, NCCS, and I think she will be a terrific partner. 
And I'm really pleased that she has this you know, strong clinical background and, and is really familiar at a personal level with survivorship challenges. Uh, ARPA-H is, uh, you know, the president talked about it on the campaign trail. So it's an idea that has been around in various forms for a while. And I think the, 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 the motivation for it is DARPA, is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, uh, has a great track record of taking on te technological, technological challenges. So DARPA was involved in the generation of the internet and GPS system and a lot of uh, important uh, defense application technology. And uh, the idea is sort of novel contracting, novel authorities move very fast, kill programs that don't work quickly, uh, you know, make funding decisions in a very rapid way, and uh, you know, sort of a nimbleness that may not characterize the NIH and the NCI in all cases. You know, a new funding initiative at the NCI can take a long time. And uh, while that is suitable for some kinds of research, and certainly there are many, many things I think the NCI and the NIH do very, very well, there may be certain kinds of research topics that uh, would be a better fit for this, this kind of an agency. Uh, really, the only uh, substantive news we have on ARPA uh, you know, uh, is uh, the president's uh, budget, which was released about two weeks ago, which included in it $6.5 billion uh, to stand up ARPA-H, which would be located within the NIH. And uh, th that's about what we know. Obviously, Congress has to take this up. Congress may do something different from what uh, the president's budget requested. Congress may uh, you know, provide its own vision of this. Uh, so we'll just have to see. But I, um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, I don't know what, how ARPH is going to run and, you know, how it's going to work exactly. But I do know what kinds of projects for cancer research are, uh, might be a good fit. You know, it, it, were there a, a new influx of funding through ARPH or some other mechanism to take on really pressing problems that with the intent of driving down cancer mortality quickly, you know, I think there are a handful of really good projects that one could take on. And these are things like, you know, a, a new and novel commitment to drug discovery using sort of modern, you know, machine learning and structural biology techniques, really interesting technologies related to cancer diagnosis. So, you know, you know, cancer screening using these multi-cancer detector tests. Uh, you know, new, new approaches to ex really expanding the arsenal in immuno-oncology. Uh, and I think a, a new, think new thinking about, you know, prevention in general using uh, sort of maybe immunologic approaches like cancer vaccines and other, other approaches, particularly in high-risk individuals. And that's like four ideas out of, you know, 50 that are, uh, that are being batted around. So I think, you know, this, commit this new commitment to cancer research and, and taking on new big projects in cancer research is very exciting. It's really galvanized the community and there's a lot of uh, discussion going on, but you know, we'll see what happens with Congress. Jelly Speaking muted. of Congress, yes, I know. <laughs> How many times are we gonna have to hear that? <laughs> You're still on mute. Um, so uh, you talked about increasing pay line and trying to get up to 15 by 25. Like what will that take from Congress in terms of increased funding in order to get there? Yeah, so uh, you know, the, the, the variable here is how many applications we get. I, I, I think, uh, you know, since like on 2012, I believe the National Cancer Institute has gotten a, a larger, more new applications to us on a yearly basis than the rest of the NIH combined, right? So, you know, there's this massive influx of uh, new ideas and new uh, enthusiasm to the NCI. And that's great. That is a great problem to have that, you know, everybody wants to cure cancer with a different idea or, you know, treat and prevent cancer with a different idea. So I, I think that is good, but, you know, uh, I don't think, you know, uh, if you think that's a good problem, it's a good problem that's going to get worse because this new national, you know, with the president saying we want to end cancer as we know it, I think that's going to further ignite enthusiasm in the extramural research community. And I suspect the number of applications to the NCI may even accelerate further, you know, beyond what we've already seen. And uh, so, so that's why it's a little hard to predict how much it would cost. We've estimated that kind of at the current trajectory of grant increases we get now. Uh, we need to put on the order of, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars into the RPG pool every year. And not, not just through 2025, by the way, because even if you stay at 15 in 2026 and on, you still have out your costs for three or four years beyond that. So it's a really, it's on the order of, a, you know, I, I think when all is said and done, it would be on the order of a billion dollars per year more to the RPG pool. And, you know, and the NCI's total budget is on the order of six and a half billion dollars presently. So that, that would be a very substantial new commitment. We cannot get there solely by 
moving funds around in the NCI, you know, by cutting, you know, some other program. There's just, you know, we, we've already done that to some extent. That's how we got from eight to 11% is by, you know, prioritizing the RPG pool. But at this stage to make that further additional progress, we'd need very robust support from Congress. Um, but, you know, uh, the good news here is that we have a bipartisan support for cancer research in Congress. And we have a president who says that he wants to end cancer as you know it. Uh, and Congress, you know, wants to support the president. So I think that um, it is, if you wanted to do that, support for investigating the church would be important. You know, I, I think that uh, there is a uh, sense of commitment to this topic now. And uh, I think it's pretty well understood, even by people who are skeptic of, skeptical of, you know, basic science in general, that that's a good use of, uh, of cancer research dollars. That really, you know, you can explain things like, that's where checkpoint inhibitors came from, and that's where Protax came from, and that's where, you know, new cancer screening devices came from. And so, so I think the success of that kind of research is, is such that uh, really uh, appropriators understand uh, why we need to continue to support that. Yeah, but it could be challenging if they're also, you know, considering putting money into this new program. I mean, that was my initial thought was like, this sounds great, this ARPH, but how, how do we make sure that it doesn't take away from the work that NCI is already doing and that we're not just shifting money from one thing to another, or at least not, you know, not continuing to increase your budget um, uh, to do the things that you want to do. Right. I, I will uh, say that, um, and th thank you for appreciating that. Uh, that is uh, an important point that uh, we should make very explicitly. Uh, the, the president's budget includes some funding additionally for the NIH, which would include a plus up for the NCI. And so uh, I think that's really important that, that um, I, I, I'm very excited about the president's approach to support both the new shiny thing that could do things that might be really cool and really great for cancer research. And I, I, I don't in any way want to say that that's not a, a wonderful opportunity, but at the same time, you know, the, the good old fashioned NCI, uh, you know, does investigators initiated science really, really well and has been very, very successful in that regard. And uh, that, that will continue to need to be supported as well. You know, one reason why it's a little easier to explain this is, uh, you know, one luxury of being the NCI director as opposed to other therapeutic disease areas is, uh, you know, the progress in cancer in terms the demonstrable progress in terms of mortality and new therapies and FDA approvals and this stuff like that is relatively straightforward to show people. So I, I you know, I, I, I think the analysis is that since I've been in federal government since 2017, we have something like, you know, 200 new approvals from the FDA, including like 80 new medicines for cancer for oncologic indications. So, uh, there, you know, that, that's very uh, impactful and, and certainly other disease areas haven't seen that kind of progress. And so I think appropriators understand that if you fund the basic science of cancer, it eventually will turn into something that's useful for their constituents. So I'm gonna turn back to something that we talked about in our first panel before you were able to join us. We had a number of um, cancer care providers talking about some of the innovations in cancer care during the pandemic and what do we wanna keep from that going forward? And we talked about um, telehealth and, and I'm excited to hear about what you all are doing to really study telehealth and figure out, you know, what are the best types of visits to do via telehealth? Um, but Dr. Deb Schrag from Dana-Farber talked about the, the um, fact that it, uh, in doing informed consent for clinical trial participation remotely was a huge benefit of the pandemic. And she's one that she said, we should not go back after the pandemic. And I wonder if you can comment on that because it seems like a big um, uh, improvement for patients. Yeah, I, you know, as, as I mentioned, we've sort of polled both the clinicians and the patients about these flexibilities and they're all very popular, you know. So early on in the pandemic, I mean, I'm talking like March or something. I mean, maybe early April, we sat down with the FDA and said clinical trials of cruel is really going to be a problem when patients don't want to come to the doctor. And, and clinical trials is very, very important in progress in, in, in research, particularly cancer research. And uh, we uh, came up with a list of things that we uh, could provide flexibility. And they were all really this issue of a protocol deviation. You know, you didn't want someone to take care of their patient in a way that was safe and would minimize their exposure to coronavirus and then have that turn into a, you know, a, a problem with the FDA later in terms of a, you know, bad conduct of the trial. And so there was lots of things. One of the main ones was allowing patients to go see a doctor closer to home rather than coming into the, the tertiary care center. So if, if particularly if they just needed a, a blood test or a, you know, a sample collection, uh, consent remotely by phone was a big one. 
the ability to ship investigational meds, so an oral IND medicine right to the patient's home rather than have, to go, have them go pick it up in an investigational pharmacy. And there are about 10 more, but all of them really allow the patient to either get care at home or get care very close to home as opposed to having to come in uh, frequently for you know, the clinical trials participation visits, which nobody wanted to do with the height of the pandemic. And they're all very popular, uh, including uh, changing auditing practices of clinical trial clinical trials. And so I think that um, we will uh, want to keep those. Uh, you know, I, I agree with, with Deb that the uh, patients like it, the doctors like it, it's, it, it enhances accrual. It's a win, win, win in every sense of the word. And, uh, you know, we have to make that very clear. We have to provide that evidence to uh, people who pay for care and who, who, just, who make decisions about uh, where the locus of care is during a clinical trial, for example. Uh, that, that this is uh, uh, good in every, in every way. The, and, and that's one of the things that I think we've learned from the pandemic that we want to keep. There, there's some other aspects of telehealth that are, I think, less straightforward. Like, you know, you've, I think we've all heard about the dermatologists doing the, you know, the skin exam by Zoom chat or something. I mean, is that, is that a good idea? So uh, that's what the RFA is about. We want to fund research to find out what, you know, because I think we'll all be surprised some things that we think ought to work don't work so well. Uh, and some things that, don't work that we you think might not auto might not work by telehealth might work really really well and uh so we just want to figure those items out we also are very interested in the effect of telehealth on disparities right. you can imagine uh, it might provide access to people who otherwise wouldn't have access to care that could be good for disparities or it might be only people with super fast internet use telehealth and that might be bad for disparities so it's not obvious to me what it's going to do uh, as a health disparities question and that i think is important for research but uh, you know, one sour note to me in all this is that we've already started to see uh, the forces that uh, you know uh, decide who pays for care where have try are, are trying now. I think to sort of re reassert some of the old rules. Mm -hmm. So, for example, one one thing that was very helpful to the cancer centers was the ability to take care of patients across state lines. Yeah. So CMS with a stroke of a pen said, if your doctor's in you know Tennessee but you live in Kentucky. You don't have to drive to, you know, the locus of care is where the doctor sits now and we'll, we'll pay for the visit, even if the patient stays up in Kentucky and does it by telehealth. And now we're starting to see some of the private payers in particular want to reverse some of those decisions and go back to the old ways for, you know, uh, reasons that are important to them. But uh, I think it's important to the NCI and our cancer center program in particular to talk about, you know, why this has been good for patients and why this has been good for care and to certainly make the evidence available to the extent possible on the effects of those policies. And, uh, you know, that's going to be an uphill battle. I think that um, anything that you can't, if you can't prove it works, uh, then people are going to assume it doesn't and try and take that capacity away. So that's why I think this is really urgent for the NCI. We've got to get these research questions answered as quickly as possible so that the payers can make the right decision. Great. Well, we are at time, and I just want to thank you very much for spending time with us this afternoon. I know you're incredibly busy, so we really appreciate you um, sharing an overview of all of the incredible work you all are doing at, at the National Cancer Institute. Well, it's thank my you. pleasure to be here again, and as I said, I look forward to doing this again in like real life someday, but yes. it's good to see you all virtually, and thank you for having me. That would be great. We'd love to have you in person when we can do that again. And I just want to thank everybody for joining us today for all of our discussions, and thank you to the NCCS team for putting on another great virtual event. Hope you all are doing well and, and we will see you hopefully in person sometime soon. Thank you.